Ruby, anything you'd like to say just to get off your chest, or do you want to wish anyone a happy birthday or anything like that? No. <laughs> Whose birthday is it? I don't know. You just like uh, this is your. I feel like I'm under if pressure. You, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> forget someone's birthday. Is this the hardest <laughs> question about? No, you do just anything you'd like to say about the 2024 Cheltenham Festival or 19th of March. It's nobody's <laughs> birthday. Hello and a very warm welcome along to the Cheltenham Festival 2024 review. My name is Tom Nugent in the company of Rory Delargy and Ruby Walsh as we reprise our roles for the Cheltenham Countdown series to look back at the festival that was the greatest show on turf indeed has unfolded just last week and we'll be looking back at all the highlights and possibly some even lowlights as well uh, to bring you through. Uh, before we begin, a quick reminder that if you're listening to this as a podcast that's also available in video format on the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel, head over there and make sure you're subscribed as there's lots more racing content coming on that platform uh, as we go through Aintree and Punchestown and indeed into the flat season. Uh, 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 the turf season is very much upon us with the Curra getting underway uh, yesterday as we record on uh, Tuesday, Bank Holiday Monday was the first meeting at the Curra. And also a reminder that if you're having a bet this week or indeed any week, always remember to do so responsibly. Gents, how are we? Okay. Grant. Grant. Tired. No, back on the bridle. No, back. Yeah. Okay, traveling. Okay, good, good, good. Um, Ruby, last week, did you enjoy it, firstly? I did. Um, I enjoyed it from start to finish, but uh, how am I going to knock myself here? I, I love it. And I guess there was enough of negativity and enough complaints and enough of people moaning, but uh, I, just, I thought it was wonderful. I thought Cheltenham doesn't deliver magic seven races a day, four days of the year, four days of the week. It never did. It was never going to. But I thought it delivered enough of magic. Do you think expectations have got out of hand now because we're talking about it for so long? Ah, no, the world has changed, Tom. Um, it's very easy to create a negative or a positive vibe about one thing or another. You just have to use social media. And um, enough of people have managed to create a negative vibe, but look, it's whether you choose to listen to it or choose to have your own opinion. Okay, independent-minded, we must remain, Roy mm -hmm. Delargy. Uh, you were watching from afar, what did you make of it? Um, well, obviously, it's, it's, the atmosphere is very different when you're, uh, when you're several thousand miles away mm. and it's Ramadan in Riyadh. But um, it, it took a wee while to warm up for me. But then again, you know, I, because I'm not getting the, the real atmosphere, I'm getting the social media comments more than anything else. So, but I thought I thought Wednesday was very good, and I thought it, it maintained things uh, from there. It just seemed to it seemed a slightly low key start, um, but I thought um, I enjoyed it from uh, from Wednesday onwards. Some more than others. Captain Guinness was very enjoyable. That helps kick things off a wee bit, you know. <laughs> okay. That's the way. That's the way it goes. I mean, you got enough people who backed the favourite in the first, or got in on the Gaelic Warrior in the second. It just changes opinion it changes people's mindset same happened at the dublin racing festival wrong three horses win the first three races people can't get a drink and all of a sudden it's the worst show on earth right three horses win the first three races no one minds how long the queue is and this is just fabulous but that's how easy it is to influence people exactly hey, yeah. a general election was influenced in america it's not that difficult yeah, yeah. well look at the drf last year you, you couldn't have had a meeting that got, that got more approval everybody absolutely loved it it was terrific there were very few complaints about anything um, and you know, you get all the right results. Everyone, everyone thought it was tremendous. And then you know, you just start on a slightly, slightly lower note, and everyone's suddenly looking oh. on the dark side, aren't they? Clock the place down. Yeah. Shut the door. Everyone go home. <laughs> so there's too many spin doctors out there. We're listening to too many different people. They're trying to influence <laughs> our opinions. Form your own opinion. My God. Okay. Well, I'd be interested to hear your own opinion because there were some talking points, and I know you were leaning into the people were too negative, Ruby, and and but Rory. Uh, attendances got a lot of airtime uh, at the festival. Obviously, yep. you weren't there, but what do you make of the numbers that we had uh, in terms of obviously a slight decline on on twenty? Yeah, you know, the, the issue they have, it seems, is 
Tuesday's always going to get a good crowd and our proper racing crowd and the atmosphere is terrific. Friday's always going to get a huge crowd, slightly slightly different crowd, but it's always going to be a, to be sold out. A very different crowd. I know standing yeah. there walking in or and coming out it was a very different crowd yes. on Friday. Yeah. And it's a slightly. It's not, I'm, I'm. I don't love the atmosphere on the Friday. It feels much more of a drinking festival than a than a racing festival. The time you get to, to Gold Cup Day, but as far as the track's concerned, that's grand for them. They're getting the money out of it. Maximum crowd. Wednesday needs work, but again, you know, if they're if they're going to call it Style Wednesday, they're almost admitting that they they find it a struggle to sell the racing. So maybe you need to move races around a wee bit. And it's a race that, it's a, wee, a day that doesn't appeal to, to all the traditionalists. You've got the cross-country chase, which is, a, which is something that tends to split the, uh, the audience, particularly in the UK. And you've got the bumper. Similarly, those are two popular races in, in Ireland, always have been. They're races that bumpers, you know, used to be the race everyone thought was an opportunity to leave the track early and get out before the traffic gets bad. And cross-country racing hasn't been a thing in the UK until, until the last... 15 odd years so those are two races on the day that don't, that maybe don't sell to a uk crowd um you can either keep the program as it is and make it cheaper it's the same price on wednesday as it is on tuesday and thursday um and if you want to get more people there it's not difficult to attract them with by taking a tenner off the price 86 quid now if you want to, I got an email, you know on monday morning saying tickets on sale for next year with a big sign saying high demand for, for Wednesday. Well, maybe there isn't such a high demand for Wednesday, so it's not difficult to, to make a little bit of a um, a push to sell those tickets early so that they don't have the problem they did uh, close to the festival. And they were still emailing people the week before trying to sell tickets for, for Wednesday, and it's not it's not rocket science, is it? Uh, Ruby, are the Jockey's Club hamstrung a little bit? Because a couple of years ago we were hearing oh, the, the crowds are too big, so it turns into a, a supply and demand issue. They raise the prices to try and maybe uh, meet their kind of threshold and maybe they're anticipating a little downfall and all of a sudden it becomes maybe slightly more less packed the yeah, customer experience is maybe a little bit I mean, harder it's, it? it's harder to know what to do isn't it it's, it's not definitely not my forte anyway mm. um, and 70 what is it 68 70,000 is capacity now and it was, I thought it was 68 but there was 69 something there on Friday <laughs> so I'm going because, to no, there's, there's, bigger, there's actually bigger capacity in Gold Cup Day than there is in the first three days All right. for whatever reason for whatever reason yeah. um, are they slightly hamstrung I think they are, right? I, and slightly more hamstring in that when you look at Cheltenham, the facility, and you look at how much infrastructure there is that's temporary, um, tent villages, shopping villages, you look at the amount of staff that are there, the costs of it, I would say Cheltenham has to be four days to turn a profit. I'd say at three days, yeah. when you look at the size of it and the volume of people that are just working there, I would say that four days is what it has to be for for a profit for Jockey Club race courses. Um, I don't think it could afford to go to three days. And is it slightly hamstrung in its pricing? I don't know. It, it's where did the drop off come? Mm. Um, and I would imagine with the way the economy is, um, especially in the UK, I mean, you only had to come back through Birmingham Airport on Friday or Thursday night to realise that there's lots of crises in the UK as regards roads, rail, airports. England is not booming. So, I would say when you look at the cost of it, yes, for people middle and further down, it probably was too expensive. And I would imagine that is where the biggest hit came on tickets. Mm. I could be wrong, but yeah. I'm just guessing. Mm. And the ticket prices that themselves are not the biggest problem for, for people. Anyone who wants to go there for more than one day, you've got to stay somewhere. And Cheltenham, Cheltenham just isn't quite big enough for the festival, is it? I mean, it's, Cheltenham it has, Town. Cheltenham Town, yeah. yeah. Cheltenham uh, has lots of little festivals and it does really well as a festival town and it's really important for the for the local economy. But when the, when the Cheltenham Festival has become so big that the, the infrastructure of the town just struggles to hold that many people. So, so hotel rooms are at a premium. I stayed on the Sunday night last year in, in a... In a Middle of the road hotel, nice enough place. Eighty nine quid on the Sunday night. The Monday night, if I wanted to stay again, was nine hundred and something quid, and that gives you an idea of just how overblown that's become. And that's a big issue for people. I think people can, you know, people don't mind because it's such a big event paying ninety quid for a, for a ticket, but they're paying five hundred quid for a hotel room. That makes them blanch a wee bit. Different story. Okay, um, let's move on then. Uh, third point of order. Uh, a very very difficult week for Nicky Henderson, obviously. Um, you could only but feel sorry for him, couldn't you? Really, like it's a, such a cruel blow, so close to the festival. Obviously, he had runners, and then decided to draw stumps with a, with the majority of them. Uh, tough week. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I, there was a fair degree of schadenfreude going around on, on uh, social media about this because, you know, we didn't get to see Constitution Hill either in the Fighting Faith or in the International Hurdle and people saying, well, there you go, there's your comeuppance. But at the same time, you know, Nicky Henderson's season really does revolve around the Cheltenham Festival. His success there has been phenomenal uh, over the years. And yeah, it was... Um, it was really tough that those horses weren't right and they couldn't get to the bottom of why they why they weren't right as well through the week. So yes, you do feel you do feel a bit sorry. And I thought um I thought um Willie Mullins did well to to, to mention that. I think he made one slightly arch comment on the Tuesday after winning the champion hurdle when he was asked you know, State Man's kind of he's not he's a sort he's not a great champion hurdle winner, is he? And he said, Well, you've got to turn up to win champion hurdles and we turned up. And that was maybe the only vague dig you got but actually after that I thought he was I thought he was he made comments about Sam Nicky's horses and, and feeling sorry for the fact that you know you build your season up to this and it doesn't work out um his sympathy was real then um and yeah you do you do have to feel a bit of sympathy whatever you feel about um Nicky Henderson some some heal him as a hero and some aren't so keen um but this is this is what the game's all about and definitely it hurt Nicky um, and you don't want to see anyone in that situation, really. To be fair to Willie, I'd say his response there was more at the person more, asking, more about the, the, person asking the question. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Um, yeah. Ruby, uh, it just goes to show nothing's a certainty with horses and their health, and, and it's so hard, and that's probably the thing that it's very hard to communicate to punters who don't really... It is. Aren't, aren't working with horses on a regular basis. This can happen, can't it? It, it can, and it, that could have been any yard. Mm. Um, it happened to be Nicky Henderson's, but the biggest thing is like you're dealing with athletes that can't talk to you and can't tell you that they're oh, I'm feeling a bit off they're still eating they look well at their eye they're not coughing their temperature's right their blood picture is good but they're just not right and you know with humans they can tell you that whereas horses can't and, and you're guessing a bit and I did feel sorry for him and for all his staff even for Nico de Bonville and his other jockeys This that's the week you want to perform and they're so far off it's not they can't even compete of course you feel sorry for them Rory uh, and, and his owners. Sorry, yeah, Michael Buckley owners, and yeah, all Tuesday yeah. night. Everyone he involved was fairly was, dejected. Yeah. Before uh, you, you mentioned feeling sorry for Nico there as well. He got a bit of criticism for an interview he did after riding in the um, uh, it was in the very Bingham, wasn't it? Was it was it on the second day asking about um, Jink, was it Jinko Bai he was on? Yeah, but he got a bit of criticism for um, for his response to that. I thought that was over the top. I thought he was actually. Trying to be good humoured. Yeah, he's pulled he's pulled a comic face and said, you know, yeah. new day, same problem. Um and I think a few people thought he was very very graceless there, but he wasn't at all. I think he was again oh. dealing with the person asking the question, understanding that it was coming anyway, and just going, It's frustrating, what can you do? I th I thought I thought your biggest that was week of the year has gone up in smoke, yeah. like it's putting yeah. a pretty pretty brave face on it. But anyway, uh, Roy, let's talk about your anti-post positions. You had a decent run of things, did you? I, I did all right. Um, if, um, if if Colonel Mustard had had sneaked into the frame mm. at 100 to 1 on the champion hurdle, it would have been a terrific um, week for me. Captain Guinness was was probably the best result. I was on him anti-post before Christmas for the champion chase. And that's a, that's a good race to punt in anti-post because really, it's one of those races where you maybe you only get five contenders, um, even for the frame. Um, so it's it's not that difficult to narrow down. You can you can get a bit of each way value. Whereas a lot of races at the festival, you might be looking at twenty horses who who might be contenders. Um, company trying to bet the Supreme, for example, is not my cup of tea at all. Mm. Uh, so Captain Guinness was good, and I ended up hitting hitting the frame with a, with a few in an in an anti post multiple. So slightly frustrating through the week. Um, I thought I made on the Monday and Tuesday, the sort of individual decisions I made weren't weren't terrific. But then again, I was always, I was thinking about my position. Mm. And then going, well, there's no point backing that again. I've really backed it. And leaving horses out of play spots and stuff because I'd back them out. It's just a crazy thing to do. So I thought, right, I'll need to get rid of that that thinking for next year. But it ended up it ended up all right. It was it was a a curate's egg okay. of a festival. <laughs> yeah, but the, um, the 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 anti post what multiple. What exactly is a curate's egg? Well it was, was neither one thing nor the other really. Uh, but, before we get stuck into the races, uh, Ruby, quick word on the gaffer. Willie uh, bro broke the the century. Um, history unfolding before our eyes. He's, he's not bad at his job, is he? No, he's all right at it. Um, I thought he put it best himself. It was never a milestone or a target. It was something that you never thought was achievable. Who would ever have thought you could train 100 winners at the Cheltenham Festival? Um, amazing, amazing achievement. And, you know, work, 
he's worked all the way from the bottom for it. Like, yeah, granted, he started with the name Mullins, but he, he has built the place around himself, built his owners, his staff, all the horses. It's incredible to go and, as far as he's gone. And changing gears and accelerating through the 100 mark, it's, it's been a, a hell of a week. Yeah, it has. And it's like, it's always about what's next, what's coming. It's it's going forward. And um, yeah, I, I think it's incredible. And I think, I suppose, like everything, people look back on it in time, they will say, wow, how did someone do that? At the moment, according to certain people, his domination is terrible for the sport. <laughs> but um, when you look back, when people look back on it in time and say, God, Remember when Willie Mullins did that? Rory, uh, greatness in our time, do you think? Is no, no, no doubt about yeah. it. He's, he's exceptional. And you only, every time Willie gives an interview, you, you just see a little bit of how he works. Everything is considered. Everything is... But it's not like he hasn't decided when you speak to him what he's going to say beforehand. So never, nothing ever sounds rehearsed with Willie. It's, he's always thinking about everything at the time and making new decisions and... You can see him analysing what's gone before and thinking about what's coming after when asking questions, when being asked about something that's just happened in an emotional moment. And I think very few people are able to to operate that way. It's it's an exceptional thing, um, and he's just all class as well. You know, every interview he gave was full of class this week. And you know, again, you know, people are having a moan about the about the domination, but you, when you're in the presence of greatness like that, clearly Vincent O'Brien dominated the, the game. In the in the fifties, and no one no one says now, oh, Vincent Bryan wasn't he terrible for for racing? Mm -hmm. um, and we're we're in the same sort of uh, situation here with uh, with Willie. Yeah, I, I believe you've you've had an interesting idea, possibly for for punting for next year's festival. Have you? Is that right? Well, I thought. Well, I thought you know you could you could look at things with Willie and without Willie, you know. And, and this is an interesting one as well because again, everyone said, well, obviously we've had. Um, You've had a couple of um, switches there with the likes of uh, Factifile going going uh, uh, not to the race he was expected to go to when we were um, discussing the novice chases um, in February and Ballyburn obviously again going for the going um, for the the longer race when he's expected to go to the Supreme and those races become quite difficult to, to punt in so you know from a from a sensible point of view um, punting without Willie. Um, gives uh, gives a different angle on things, although other people are still, you know, Henry de Bromhead made the switch with uh, uh, with Sayed Steel because of where Willie went, and you wouldn't necessarily be back on back on that horse for the Supreme. But uh, the other, the flip side to that, not from the betting point of view, is again people keep talking about how how Willie's dominating, and that's well. If you take Willie's horses out of the Cheltenham Festival, you still have, you know, ten of the Grade One races would have gone to Irish stables. And this is the thing, what Willie's doing is he's raising the bar for, for Irish trainers. And what, what British trainers need to, need to see is that they need to raise their own bar. They can't sit there moaning about it and trying to work out how to change the programme to suit themselves. They need to pull themselves up by their, by their bootstraps, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not easy to do. There's no simple solution to it. you just got to keep working at it and you've got to look for excellence all the time. The one thing I find interesting, even looking at it, is so you look at, say, they say, well, why have those English owners gone to Ireland? this prize money, prize money, prize money. It's more than prize money. And you look at the, some of the theories and the solutions as to what should happen at Cheltenham, and it all goes back to the one thing, uh, more handicaps, more handicaps. What have the big owners run away from? A handicap system. Yeah. That is not, that. and you're talking about different theories and playing systems and, anyway. It, 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 you look at British racing, the Irish program encourage it, that encourages you to have a top novice. The English program doesn't encourage you as much. Very good. Uh, Cheltenham Festival 2025 markets without Willie Mullins. Watch this space uh, brought to you by the good people at Paddy Power alongside Rory Gillardy. Right, let's get stuck into having a look at, through some of the performances this uh, week just gone. Let's kick things off with the Supreme Novices Hurdle. Obviously Slade Steele, a rousing winner of the opening race of the festival at Rory Gillardy. Um How would you rate the performance and, and what would you expect from him going forward? I think it was... It was a decent performance. He did well to overcome a slightly slow jump at the last, and he was passed by, uh, by Mystical Power. He did well to to respond and come up the hill strongly. I, he's, he's not a champion hurdle horse, I don't think, um, on that showing. And I think, again, if you just, if you stick Ballyburn in the race, it looks a very different contest as well. Um, he's he's likeable. 
Um, I think two and a half miles plus will be where he'll where go in the future. Um, you could go chasing with him next season without any hassle. I, and I, I suppose that's probably, if you, if you don't think he's going to be a champion hurdle horse, then chasing's the obvious, the obvious option. With a lot of these horses, a lot of the, the, the races at, at Cheltenham, because of the um, a combination of the, the ground, but also the field sizes for a lot of the, the good races, um, you'll end up learning a lot more about some of these horses from Punchestown than you would have in the past. Often you get the big performances at Cheltenham and then Punchestown, maybe you follow up, maybe it's, it's a race too far. I think this season, um, horses have ended up having maybe slightly easier races at Cheltenham than they, than they would do. And um, they've got an opportunity of actually doing more at Punchestown. So it'll be interesting to see how Slade Steel gets on uh, if he runs again um, this season. He got a bit warm and he was a little bit keen in the race, but he, he did well then to, to win um, given those circumstances. I thought um, I thought Firefox uh, shaped as well as anything in the race. He just got, um, he came with a run between horses and ran out of room between the last two hurdles and the race got a bit messy at that point. I thought he'd, and he lost a bit of momentum and then came up strong, came strongly up the hill. I thought that was a nice performance um, and I'd be, um, I'd be keeping, a, a, certainly keeping him in my notebook. Uh, Ruby Willie obviously had the uh, runner-up, uh, Mystical Power, Tully Hill didn't fire, Asian Absolutely. Master came wide but ran well, uh, Super Sunday out the back, and Mr. Yeah. Giff mid-div, well, give us a rundown of some words. Mr. Giff was a bit keen, thought Mystical Power ran a cracker um, on reed ground probably that was too slow yeah. from looking at his pedigree, Tully Hill bombed out, thought he was getting it so easy in front and jumping like a buck, but the top of the hill, you didn't really want to be on him, Pod's body language wasn't uh, sufficient, Super Sunday, it was his first start, he'd be a better horse next year, and Asian Master probably wanted a little bit further, but um, thought the winner was the best horse in the race. And I thought that with a lot of the races at Cheltenham, I thought the best horse just won. Yes. I can't yeah. think of too many hard luck stories throughout the week. And Slade Steel, yeah, to me, he looks a chaser. It was kind of a beano for punters that way, wasn't it? It was generally speaking, the the better horse got the job done in the, in the kind of level way it's races generally. Yeah, if you, weren't, if you weren't desperately looking for value in inverted commas, you know, just finding the obvious horse, yeah. even in the handicaps, um, was, was the way forward. And... Because, you know, we'll probably touch on the fact that you, the, the fields were smaller than normal there. But because of the small fields, there was less, you know, in a 20-runner in a, a Supreme, a 20-runner Supreme, a twenty runner, um, Brown Advisory, you've got a different kind of race. You've got to, you've got to try to avoid the, 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 the um, pitfalls. Um, you've got to keep out of the way of trouble. Whereas in a small field race, you could just ride your race and the best horses should come to the fore. I thought it was ground as well. I thought real soft yeah. ground and I thought... Even from watching some of the racing earlier in the year in the UK, I thought the riders rode the ground. I thought it was good to watch. There was no absolute slogs where they're going up and down to one spot, which there could have been. Yes. I thought they yeah. got the pace of the races right and they finished the races and it made them better spectacles. Let's move things on then to the Arkle. And going down to the start, I thought Gaelic Warriors race was run. But, and I'd never give him a compliment to his face, but I'll compliment him <laughs> behind his back. I thought it was a town and masterclass. Didn't panic when he was headed. Yeah. And because he could have hung like a gate if you asked him, could he? He could have, but I'd say, I thought in the parade, sorry, the parade ring, his race was run. Mm. When yeah. I watched him go to the start, I was more, I was happier with him. Um, I think getting a lead was a huge help to him, just to get him to, to jump straighter. Um, like they quickened off the top of the hill and Paul let, found a 50 by him. I think he was happy actually. Sitting. He was. He was happy to let him with you. Mm. And he just kept sitting and he came alive off the home turn, two good jumps the last two fences and he was really impressive. Like, I mean, and you talk about betting without Willie, I mean, when he won the three-mile novice hurdle at Punchestown, you would have wanted a crystal ball to say you'd see him ending up in the air. Indeed, yeah. Mm. yeah. What changed between Leopardstown and Cheltenham for Gaelic Warrior, do you think? More work, dropped him back in trip. It was the trip that David wanted to go for a long time, Casey. He maintained he was the fastest two-miler we had. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just a couple of things like that. And just like attitude changed or no he's just the same horse it just uh, the, yeah. he settled better he relaxed he raced um, you look back now and you look at the speed of the race in Leperstown looks like he just overdid it in the first mile, mile, mile and a quarter mm. Rory for you uh, top class performance yeah I, I, I wrote down he definitely benefited from the hood and that's you know not every horse does but he's he's the, the ideal horse to do that and he's all for all he stays he, he, he will stay three miles over fences but 
there's no need to be trying that because so much can go wrong from over over that trip and he can get himself in trouble. He wants a lead. He wants horses to pull him into the race and therefore, because he's got so much talent, two miles will be his trip because that's that's the distance that horses will pull him through the race and make him um, an easier ride. And, you know, it was a not your ideal scenario for his his prep to be over over two mile five at a, essentially at a two horse race um, because, you know, everything conspired against him that day. And, you know, he did for the, for about a mile and three quarters. He's, he's flown through that race looking very good, but he's just doing... He's doing everything. He's doing too much in front, and then when when something does go wrong, then it all goes wrong very quickly. It all unravels. Whereas as long as as long as he's got something to aim at, he looks like a much a much easier ride. And the fact that he was pretty straight throughout was is uh you know really encouraging. It means you can race him wherever you want really. But he'll always be you know there's there's you still always will have that problem with him if he's in a small field race. He can uh, he can get himself beat, but in a really good race. Um, he's got a chance of actually coming through and, and, and winning then because he's got tons of class and the way those the way a very good races tend to be run will uh, will bring out the best in him. What do you do to straighten him up, Ruby, at home, or is there anything that you can do? Was it just on the day he he jumped a bit straighter? Just or? getting the lead. So yeah. he followed. The horses are a hard animal. So when the horse in front of him was going straight, he followed the one in front of him. When he's in front. He kind of does his own thing. Does it every once. Okay, very good. Uh, let's move on to the Ultima then. And the Brits got on the board here with Chianti Classico. Uh, possibly the biggest shout of the day, uh, biggest reception of the day in the winner's enclosure for uh, for David Bass, who gave it the big one all, all the way up the shoot, and rightly so. Uh, Rory, what did you think of his performance and anything in behind that caught your eye? Yeah, it was a good performance. It, um, it came barely a two horses with, with similar profiles in there. They both had big chances on paper. Um, Chianti Classico had got, a, got the perfect Kim Billy prep for the race. Trelawn also was really interested, but he came down at the second fence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were both we were both keen on Trelawn. But I, with, yeah. the time he jumped off, yeah. I thought he had no chance. He didn't even want to go to the first fence. No, no, it, and that's, um, you, know, you don't know that beforehand. No. But, um, there was a few of them that week, this week where the riding was on the wall um, at the first fence. But um, yeah, he was... He he got in there off, off a, a good mark. He's a he's a sound job. He's just a typical Kim Bailey horse, uh, really. And um, Kim Kim has um, has reinvented himself essentially as a different kind of trainer to he was twenty twenty five years ago. Of course, he's you know won the champion hurdle, won the gold cup, won the grand national, um, and plenty of trainers would have hung their boots up by now and be walking around in the bedroom slippers, enjoying what they've gone before. But he's he's reinvented himself. He realizes his best chance of winning good races is um, with well-schooled novices in handicaps, mm -hmm. and that's the way he, um, that's the way he trains his horses these days. And you know, maybe one of those will turn into. Uh, we had a Grade One winner a couple of seasons ago, obviously at uh, at Ascot. Mm -hmm. One, you know, maybe he'd get a superstar out of that. But he's he's um, he's aiming these good horses at the handicaps before the handicap and get an idea of exactly how good they are. And it was a good result. Um, I thought um, I thought the golfer caught the eye in behind. I, for all for all, he's run well over an extreme trip. Gives the impression he doesn't stay three miles to me. Mm. Um, you could say that he maybe wasn't fit enough. You know, he had that. Uh, he had his his, uh, his charity race uh, warm up, but I don't think I don't think he was left short. I think he was fit enough. I think he doesn't quite stay um, in the company he's capable of running in. I think he's an interesting one for the Paddy Parr in November. I think dropping back to to two and a half might actually suit him. Um, his two wins of, of over fences have come over two mile, two mile five and two mile six. Um, so something like the Paddy Power or the December Gold Cup will suit him, and he caught the eye. Meeting the water similarly mm. travelled very well through the race and and um, didn't see it out quite as strongly. I don't, I don't think there was talk of him being a Gold Cup horse. Um, I don't think that's the case, but he's clearly got more. Um, he's got more winning to do. Mm. Interesting. Uh, were you doing your shaking your fist? Get the novices out of our handicaps, were you, when he crossed <laughs> the line? Well, it's not even get the novices out of the handicaps. It doesn't really bother me too much either way, to tell you the truth, Tom. But when people are bemoaning where are the runners in the novice chases, key anti classico and meeting in the waters, two novices, first and third, and the handicappers are second, where we've all been caught with the novice as well. I just think when you go in against novices with a heart. We have a handicapper like Twig and you run into two horses like Chianti Classico meeting of the water so the handicapper can't possibly have maximised or, yeah. or have a real handle on. Uh, you just wonder where the runners are in the novice chases but that's the British system. It's all novice handicaps. You're encouraged to be getting yourself the best mark and then you're wondering where the horses are in the novice races. They devise the system. 
Champion Hurdle, uh, the feature race on day one, and State Man got his day in the sun. Obviously a multiple grade one winner already, but hadn't quite managed to bag the big one at the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, Ruby, um, ridden like the best horse in the race, was it a grind or was he just doing enough? It was a sprint, wasn't it really? Mm. Um, and I reckon, you know, Paul kind of surprised Willie with the way he rode him, but Paul was of the opinion he was riding the best horse and the fastest horse, and he rode him like the fastest horse, and that's ultimately what won the race. He quickened well to beat Irish Point. Lucia kind of gave the Seven Barrows team a glimmer of hope, and you're thinking, wow, could they, will they, might they, maybe. Um, ultimately, they didn't, but she's won an absolute cracker, and Zarek the Brave was well beaten uh, in fourth, but it was just get the job done. It's what statement generally does and it's exactly what Paul Townend does just get it done thought Irish Point ran well could be an interesting horse if you went something like the entry hurdle yeah I, I could but the connections have Bob Bollinger so yeah. I imagine that's where he's going and Irish Point kind of caught between the rock and the hard place isn't he mm. you've got Chupu and Irish Point will Irish Point go back up the three miles at entry and Chupu go to Punchestown maybe that's the way they'll split them yeah I think so I think so because um, Chupu's you know, he's he's now got this reputation of being best after after a break, and he was deliberately brought in very fresh to Cheltenham. So, gives Irish Point a uh, a chance to prove something in the uh, in the Liverpool hurdle. Um, you know, they, he's won over three miles already. That was, Gordon had said prior to uh, Leverstown at Christmas, he'd be going up to three miles, and that would be the um, you know he thought it would be the making of him. Um, so, I, you know, I thought he's run an absolute cracker in the champion, given that a sprint at two miles. Uh, wouldn't really have, uh, have suited him. So whether he's, I mean, he didn't have to really prove his stamina um, thoroughly at Leopard at Christmas because he outclassed the opposition. He was, it wasn't, a, it, home by the Lee wasn't on his game that day and therefore couldn't make it a test of stamina no. that he wanted. So Irish Point has won it through speed. But I think, you know, he'll be, he should be effective at that three miles and it's nice to have two strings to your bow in a race like that. Your take on the this year's champion hurdle as a whole, what are you what are you what are you thinking? I, th I think you can't knock State Man. I know he hasn't been wildly impressive on the day, but he's been you know, did Paul lift his stick on him at all? No, but even no. I was talking to someone before us and, and they were on about the distance and I was thinking, God from memory, does State Man never win far? And when I look back through it, he won a maiden hurdle by seven lengths, but other than that, it all revolved right around where the bookmakers had the spread, five yeah. lengths. Yeah. He never goes away and blows a field apart. Mm -hmm. He just goes there for wins and then That's it. I've done enough. But, and this is a common theme with some of the races at Cheltenham this season. You, you can knock the bare form, the, 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 you know, the performance ratings of the big race winners because you've beaten X horse by this number of lengths, therefore you can't possibly say this is a, this is a top class performance. But when you're able to win causally, then and what, what else can you do? Really? Causally should encourage longevity. If yeah. you're never going to the well, if you're never asking horses for everything they have, they should be able to keep going and keep repeating it for longer. Uh, very good. Uh, let's look at a few of the other performances on day one of the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, Ruby, starting with Lozzy Mouth, who was, uh, she was very good. fairly good. Yeah, she was, dropped in, crept around, um, and she was very decisive on the day. But I think she, she needed to be Mm. or she has to be I still think that she has a bit to go to get from there up to where Statement is definitely to where Constitution Hills oh, yeah. Hill is possibly be to where Ballyburn could be listening to Willie Mullins um, so like she's going in the right direction but she has to be better at 6 than she was at 5 uh, Are you putting cold water on the possibility of a champion hurdle tilt next year? Well, I think she will and Willie has said it that's the way she's going to go but I still think she has to improve. I think beating Tell Me Something Girl, Hispanic Moon and Lantry Lady, that's the, the, the bare bones of the form. And I guess when you look at the champion hard line, look where Zarek the Brave finished as a five-year-old. It's just not as hard and fast as most people think. Yeah, she, I mean, that's, she would have finished... If you, if you translate her, the form that she showed there and put it into the champion hurdle, she probably would have finished third. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know... I don't want to say readily held third because you don't get to see you what she could have no, done. Exactly. But it's simply, it's simply transferring the performance. So that's what she needs. That's the improvement she needs to find. But in fairness, um, five-year-olds don't tend to be massively competitive in champion hurdles. Um, taken as a whole, obviously we have had we've had a, a couple of winners in the last twenty years. Um, but I think the campaign that Willie's given her gives her a chance of progressing again. This, the idea of, of taking the first half of the season off, I'd like to see a lot more Triumph Hurdle horses 
given the similar preparation, not just the mares, you know, give them time to develop a little bit. Most of, them, most of them need to. The horses, the ultimate opportunity to be the best that they can be. Yeah. That doesn't sit with too many people. And no. that is a lot of the problem. You cannot, you have to try and give the horses. And that's why William Mullen stands hard and fast on it. And that was his answer when he was asked in Cheltenham. He's trying to give his horses the best that they can be. But look, we're in such a rush as a society. Yeah. We don't even watch adverts anymore. Yeah. Let alone wait for a horse to fulfill its potential. 18 months down the line. Yeah. Like That's just crazy. How yeah. could you expect anybody to do that? Uh... Rory, quick word on Lark in the morning. A plan well made. Yeah, and they seem to get away with the ground. That'll be an excuse for for Ram uh, for a couple of no shows and the fact that you know he's um, he hadn't fulfilled what had seemed to be like great potential. Um, well, I think he was, was a big eye catcher as a as a young horse. Um, he won a barrier trial at Dundalk in, in great style, and a few people raving about him then. Um, so he's 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 um, got the job done. But I mean, the, the it, it just it shows what a good trainer of juveniles Joseph O'Brien is, and I think you know that's essentially where where Joseph's strength is, and when it comes to national hunt racing, um, he's he's very good with young horses, um, and he's won that race twice now recently. Um, he's got he strictly speaking doesn't have that doesn't have that uh, uh, initial triumph hurdle win to his name. The stewards had him in when <laughs> yeah, when yeah. Ivanovich Gorbachev won, saying, "Why are you behaving like you trained the winner at Cheltenham?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is quite amusing. Um, but uh, yeah, he's very very good with with that that kind of horse. But he's very good with that kind of horse on the on the flat as well. And he's um, he's he's going to be more flat orientated in the future, I think. But that was that was a good uh, bit of training. But you know, he's he's beaten the rank outsider in second. He's run a run a cracker for Ross O'Sullivan. <laughs> he's uh, yeah. yeah, ran a blinder. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, that would that would have been a, that would have been a great result for, for everybody, result, wouldn't yeah. it? But you know, the, the 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 boodles isn't really a race to to take home after the festival, is it? Uh, quick word on Corpus Cross and the National Hunt Chase. Very impressive. Was he the best of a moderate bunch? He was. Two horses give the running in that race for me. Him and Mr. Van Gogh. So essentially, he's beaten Mr. Van Gogh twenty five lengths. How good is that? He's done it very easily, but. Um, Disappointing. The the trio who who ran in the Reynolds Town at Ask it all looked quite interesting on paper, and none of them have run to that level again. None of them jumped um, particularly really well. well. Ben Pauling's horse who won was was beaten a long, long, long way from home, and he clearly um, hadn't uh, hadn't come out of that race particularly well. The other two, Quebec King. Um, had jumped well at Kempton. He was very low at Ascot and still ran a cracking race to be second. And he was low again at too many fences at Cheltenham. And that spoiled his chance of winning. Um, Apple away, I, I thought she would improve a lot for the step up and trip. But again, she's, she doesn't quite, she, she's just a little bit messy at her fences and she hasn't, she hasn't shown the same, same form over fences as she did over hurdles. She had every chance the way she was ridden. So that was a wee bit disappointing. So Mr. Vine goes, gone out in front. Um, and give them a target and Corbett's Cross has come through. MC Gardens obviously made several mistakes in the race, but the one he made at the second last knocked the, the wind out of his sails completely, so you could ignore him. So really, that's what, you, that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, the beauty, if, if you've got a horse like Corbett's Cross, is you've won a grade two at Cheltenham without having to come off the bridle, set you up nicely for whatever else you want to do. Mm -hmm. But it also tells you what the problem with, with the National Hunt Chase now is, is that making it a quasi grade one you're always going to have small fields now. You, it's going to be an easy option for a horse like like Corbett's Cross. Uh, and Cheltenham need to work out what the National Hunt Chase is meant to be. The National Hunt Chase was historically the race of the festival, but it was a maiden chase. Nothing that had won a race was eligible to, to run in it or at the time of entry. And I think they just go back to, to square one and say, you know, it's, I it's fully, a maiden chase. I fully agree. It's not even the beginners. You had to be a maiden at the start of the season. So you couldn't have won a bump or a maiden hurdle any of those races. I think you could have won one hunter's chase. Might right, have been yeah. in it. And, but what that also encompassed was a wider demographic of owners, trainers, yeah. etc. Mm. And it was a much bigger field. I don't think it's worked since it came in as a novice chase. I think it's the one novice chase that is sucked away more than the other novice yeah. chases. So... That would just be a small tweak, and I, but I do think I started as an amateur. I would be fighting for amateurs to keep the races they have, the races they can ride in. Yeah. Um, it was the first ride I had at Cheltenham Festival, so I, I fully agree with, the, with that. But I would be going back to it being 
I'm not sure how you get there, but it well, has to encompass a wider demographic. Yes, exactly. Would it be fair to maybe say that the VHA get a bit, little bit windy about it? They don't really like it. They've tried to change the rules no, to make it again, safer. It makes them a little bit yeah, but Chel- yeah, and, and Chel- Cheltenham Racecourse as well are, are, are part of that. Yeah, and it was it was that that one race, what was it, four years ago yeah, now? Where, just before where, lockdown, yeah. was it? But that, <clears> unfortunately, <throat> encompassed two or three grade two novice chasers racing with a load of horses that were the old style national exactly. hunt chase yeah. and the four good ones pulled the others that were of lesser ability too fast yeah. and they got tired whereas if you just confine it to all horses of the one ability mm. yeah. they won't go as hard and yeah it's not it's not you d- i think a lot of races at the Cheltenham festival you need to sit down and say right we'll, we'll make unique um qualification criteria for these races to keep their their initial spirit and obviously you don't necessarily have to have a bunch of horses who've never won anything you just have entries for it in january you can win a race from then on you can win a, obviously a point to point you can win you can win a hundred chase but you can win your novice chase between entry and the festival itself and you're still qualified but yes keep a wide demographic in there keep graded horses out of it so you tell them that they've made the mistake of thinking they want to get more graded horses in all the races but and that's only, actually completely the opposite only a certain they, want, they want to filter the, the top quality horses to certain races and make sure that other races and that's i i spoke to um I spoke to Ian Renton about six, six or seven years ago about about an idea for for different races at the festival, and so I put up the idea of the, the selling hurdle, which is I I love that. <laughs> but he was horrified. But he goes, no, 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 we need to have more quality. And I said, you you, you can't have more quality. Yeah. If you have more races, you have to have less quality by definition. Yeah. But it was like there's no understanding of that. So I, I'd like to see races like the National Hunt Chase retain their old character. Yes, you need to make sure that it's reasonably, but the, the, you, you increase safety by ensuring you don't have graded horses racing against horses who are three stone inferior to them. You basically say, listen, this is this is for good old fashioned plotters um, and it's good to see them do their job, but they're not, it's, it's almost like, it's a hunter chase almost, but not for, not with a hunter chase um, Qualify, Third, qualifying yeah. criteria um, and that's that's fine it's okay to have races like that at the Cheltenham Festival Okay uh, work required to the conditions of the National Hunt Chase then uh, Ruby final word on day one Patrick Munn's got an eight day ban for his ride in the National Hunt Chase uh, any any insight as to why that happened it seems uh, like he's missing a day at Ferry House there. Yeah and the same for Mark Walsh got a four day ban for one flick um, on fact to file different whip rules they both fell foul but it was for Mark using his using his whip once, Patrick using his whip twice, but the way the tot up works in the UK, that's what it was for. Yeah, it was well. Um, Patrick was for not giving the horse time to respond, so it's yeah, basically it's about the, the yeah the time between between strikes. And for Mark, it was for hitting the horse in the wrong place. He cut the horse down the flank. Yeah, and so Mark only flick yeah. factified once like that. And Look, they, you know, was, he'd be annoyed by that because yeah. you know he didn't need, he didn't no. need to do it at all. It was no big deal, but according to the rules, it's um, you know. It's a bad. Rules are indeed rules. Okay, that's Tuesday in a nutshell. Wednesday coming up right after this break. Introducing Paddy Power's new money back tokens for racing. The flexibility to choose the race in which you get your money back offers. Claim your token via the homepage banners or through the promotions page. Add your selection to your bet slip from any eligible money back race. Apply the money back token to the selection. Choose your stake and place your bet. Easily track the horses on which you've used a money back token in my bets. Get your money back as a free bet if the horse finishes second, third or fourth. Get brand new money back tokens with Paddy Power. Okay, we're back for Wednesday. Here's your obligatory reminder to subscribe to the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel. Uh, righto, let's get stuck in the Gallagher, Gallagher Novices Hurdle. And Ballyburn was a very, very impressive winner with the distinctive low head carriage ruby. Uh, he blew them all away. Don't even need to delay too long here, Tom. He was exceptional. Loved William Mullins' comments that if he has a horse, maybe that could do a dawn run, he might try and do it with this fella if his owners are, are willing to do it. That sounds like it could be fun, but he would just jump, travelled and blew the opposition away. Yeah, Rory, not much to say really. It's just as simple as, as simple does. When your eyes are telling you something yeah. is good, maybe it's just that simple. Yeah, and the, and the, the clock told you that as well. And it wasn't always the case with the uh, with the big races um, this week because of the way they were run, but um, the... Uh, Everything about that performance was was out of the top drawer, and obviously it was a one, two, three, four, five for Willie. Um, not quite in the in the realms of uh, Michael Dickinson's Gold Cup quintet, but still pretty impressive and a great one. Mm, onwards we go. Brown Advisory Factify, another a very impressive performance. And Rory, uh, I thought he did a lot wrong, and he still managed to look like he was doing it very right as he crossed the line. 
Yeah, again, he's he's been able to learn on the job there, um, and he's a. I would have been worried, and in an old fashioned um, Brown advisory slash RSA, he might have got in trouble um, because he had very little experience coming into the race. But the nature of the Grade One novice chases, Arkle aside, at the um, on the Grade Two novice chases um, at Cheltenham these days means you don't get big fields and horses who've got lots of class but lack experience aren't punished for. It. Indeed, Monty Star was only having his third start over fences and second as well. So um, a lot to like about it. But again, in terms of what he achieved um, on the book, he's, he's a long way short of, of Gold Cup standard on that. But of course, this is only his second season racing uh, with no with no novice uh, hurdle campaign. So there's a lot of improvement to come. And again, you know, if you if you offered connections um, this season at the start of it, right, you'll have to, you know, you'll win, a, you'll win essentially a match um, in, your, in your prep and then you'll win a small field um, Brown advisory at the end of it, um, you'd, you'd have taken that. You know, he doesn't need to be getting involved in wars at this stage. There'll be plenty of wars ahead of him. So it's just, it's the ideal novice chase season. He's learning all the time. He's picking up good graded prizes um, and he retains that scope for improvement next year. Does, as again, on the figures, he needs to improve a fair bit, but he was never going to be able to put up a massive performance given the nature of the race because he was he was there to pick up the uh, the front runners and he's done, it, he's done it nicely in the end. Uh, do you see that improvement within? Could you see him going on to bigger and better things next yes, year? Yes, I mean, I don't know what a ceiling is liable to be and it's, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to suggest that what he what he produced in the day is as good as he is um but i also don't want to say oh he's definitely a gold cup horse very difficult to know what his what his ceiling might be he's very very likable he's got a good attitude he's got a good jump on him um and you know he's he's in a good place now for um uh for, for willie to step him up next season it'll be interesting to see you know he's kind of a horse who, who would Make a fair bit of appeal in a, in a John Durkin to start with, and you know he's he's adaptable in terms of trip two and a half to three. So there's lots of um, lots of good races for him to to win next season. Ruby, myself, being a man who knows very little about anything, uh, he did look like he did a bit wrong, a little bit lit up. Chin was out going down the back straight and was long at a few of his fences. Took chances. I thought Mark gave him a great ride. He looked like a horse that had been running over shorter distances. He wanted to race like a horse that had been racing at a higher cruising speed. Um, and Mark had to teach him that through the first mile of the race. I thought he gave him a great ride. I liked what I saw. He has the potential to improve into a Gold Cup horse. But Rory's right. He has to improve into that. Uh, we were. I was. I was on another preview before uh, uh, the day itself, and we were talking about the project of obviously uh, d skirting around the novice hurdle se uh, season to kind of s expediate things a little bit. That that seems to be paying dividends. I, now. I'd say it was age related as much as anything else. Um, he was was he six or seven winning the winning the Brown Advisory. He was older. I knew it. He was seven. Yeah, seven, yeah. seven yeah, yeah, that's why he didn't go novice novice hurdling mm -hmm. because. He'd be seven rising eight as a novice chaser, yeah. so they went straight away because of age. Let's move on to the Carl Cup. Langer <laughs> Dan. Uh, got the uh, got the mob shouting in the streets. The pitchforks were out for Langer Dan, Rory, were they? Uh, it was a little bit. In fairness, you know, there, were, there were comments about Langer Dan before he turned up at Cheltenham when he ran his, his prep race. There were quite a few people going, Oh, you can see you can see exactly what's happening here. You can see what's happening. He's just gonna get a you know, turn up at Cheltenham, having dropped down to his his last mark, and you'll see a different horse in March. And of course, that's exactly exactly what happened. And it's, you know, it's worth pointing out on his prep race was the, the Lanzarote hurdle. He's gone off on on the on the exchange. What was he sixty six to one SP, one hundred and fifty to one um, on the exchanges for that race. So although he had an excuse, he came up with a with a broken blood vessel. The market seemed to know he was going to break a blood vessel before the race started. Dan Skelton has played the system there, and and you know as far as I'm concerned, the system is there to be played. That's this is what we're talking about: the handicap system and the way horses are treated, and and the way the um, uh, the way the whole system is set up in in the UK. You're basically encouraged to to play it, particularly for the for the big handicaps. And I don't think there was much hidden there. You know, Dan has tried to get Langer Dan um, in the right place for Cheltenham for the last four seasons. Um, and he's managed. He's run very well. He ran. He ran really well in the uh, in the Fred Winter as a, as a four year old. And he's been back several times. Run twice in one week, uh, and ran ran very well. So this is this is where he comes alive. He's shown nothing all season, but he didn't show an awful lot last season before he turned up to win the race. And people can get angry about that um, all they like, but that's you either play the system or you stand up and say, "Oh no, I refuse to play the system," and you don't win the races. 
And if you're a if you're a resource trainer who refuses to play the system, what exactly you know what are you in the game for? Um, you know, it's it's all um, it's just the, it's just the way it is. Um, the very good point was made about the fact that he had an excuse for running badly at Kempton, um, but the handicapper dropped him two pounds. Now, th that's a very good point. There is, I was told, spoke to Phil Smith years ago, and he said, this is how it works. If you run well, but you show they're not good enough to win a race, then you'll get dropped in the race. Trainers always complain they don't get dropped as quick as they go up. He said, listen, if you run in a race and you finish fifth or sixth, and you've clearly run on your merits, then I'll drop you three pounds, no problem at all. He said, but if you run, finish out the back of the field, I'm not going to drop you at all. Well, horses who finish out the back of the field regularly get dropped one or two pounds by the BHI handicapper, and they clearly shouldn't. Um, you know, horses should be seen to be running on the merits, and if they're not quite good enough to win off the mark, then drop them, and drop them by more than one pound. But if they're beating 150 lengths, they're not running on, the, they're not running on their merits for whatever reason, maybe because they're not able to, um, they shouldn't be getting dropped a pound here or there. He wasn't dropped at all for his reappearance. But there's pressure on the handicappers these days because you've had a couple of um, you've had a couple of appeals um, at Sheldon in the last couple of years, including the uh, the winner of the Coral Cup uh, a few years ago. Um, so there is a bit of pressure for them to 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 drop horses. But really, the the system should be a lot more transparent. People should know what to expect with the way the horses run. Um, and I think the fact that you're getting small drops for, for runs that are completely out of kilter with, with the horse's uh, form line shouldn't be happening. Um, and we should see horses at least vaguely competitive. You know, people are saying, oh, my horse, is, my horse is too high in the weights. And look, he's hopelessly tailed off. That proves, well, it doesn't, that doesn't prove it at all. Your horse finishing sixth or seventh and trying his best is proof that he's too high in the weights. Your horse beating, beating 100 lengths is proof that you haven't trained it for the race. It was it was put to me uh, in Cheltenham that if, if Langerdan was cha trained in Ireland, they'd be throwing rotten tomatoes into the winner's enclosure. They'd be shouting and roaring. But I think the key factor there, Ruby, is that the Irish handicapper probably wouldn't have slipped uh, Langerdan back down the weights if he was trained in Ireland so far. Is that right? Oh, actually, all he had to do, I don't know, maybe he would have. There were plenty of bad runs and the handicappers do or are trying to give horses chances so they're coming down in the ratings. Um, look, I'd say most of the official handicappers have forgotten more about handicapping than I know about it, but that is the system. You've got to play the system, and if so many people could see it, I'm just amazed he went off 13 to 2. As big as that? Yeah. yeah. So if everybody knew, listening to them after the race, everyone mm. knew, everyone could see it. Why didn't more people back him if they really knew it? Well, this is true. This is true. But of course, you know, people will want to back a winner and also have a moan about it as well. You want to have to yeah, take yeah, an yeah, easy. Yeah, it, take it's easy. also worth pointing out, we, won't, we probably won't touch much on the race otherwise. Unexpected Party was also was also lined up um, for a bit of a touch, um, a much quieter one, one of a 12 to 1. But again, Dan Skelton, um, he he appeared on on the thing, the final episode of the the Road to Cheltenham with you and Lydia, and basically said, you know, these horses will should run well at Cheltenham mm. and come into themselves at the right time. Unexpected party, he said, well, I've just come to the conclusion he doesn't stay two and a half miles. We'd run it two and a half miles fourteen times, mm. and hardly ever. The only times he'd, he'd ever run it two miles, aside from on his hurdling debut, was in the Henry VIII Novice Chase at Sandown two years running when he was out of his depth. So here he is having his first run competitively, essentially, over two miles, and he won well. And that's also playing the system, but it's playing the system in a different way. And I've got no problem with the trainer playing the system. If you've got, you know, if the authorities have a problem with it, they need to deal with it by having, by, you know, by um, having more robust um, principles, looking at, you know, having stewards, I have a handicapper on the stewards panel, or at least having a handicapper saying, this is what this horse should have done and this is what it has done, ask those questions. Because sometimes you'll get the stewards, um, I've seen a horse get a get a, um, a ban from the stewards for not trying and get dropped by the handicapper the same week. I saw one of those at Warwick a couple of seasons ago and that doesn't make any sense. The two of them should be working together. So you shouldn't have the stewards doing one thing and the handicapper doing something else. Those two need to be tied together. Mm. But if it was stood, uh, <laughs> to me handicapping, like if you look, at the horses and you're thinking to yourself, Langer Dan, when I saw him in Cheltenham last year, like I could see all his ribs. I'm looking at him now, I can't see a rib. <laughs> yes. like, I'm not dropping you. Mm. It's the handicapping is ultimately an opinion yeah. that has become formulated, that they have to now go by the formula. Mm. And I don't think that particularly works. It is opinion. It should be left to opinion. And, and even you look at Bally Adam, 
what is it? And Langer Dan got ten pounds for winning the Coral Cup. So what's that? Five runs to get him back down yep. to one forty one again. You look at Bally Adam, ran a last year's county hurdle off one forty eight, finished fifth. Runs this year's Coral Cup off one forty seven, finished the second. He goes up two pounds. To me, he is a one forty seven. Yeah. So yeah. it's off him. You work everything else. Mm. But look, that's again. Handicappers have a job to do. I'm not going to stick the knife in. It's a tale as old as time, and I think the long and short of it is, well done, Dan Skelton. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. onwards we go. Uh, the Queen Mother Champion Chase. Uh, firstly, Ruby, any news on El Fabiolo? All, go, all okay? Yeah, uh, I think he is. Um, he was okay. Whatever day Randy went home, he was fine, yeah. Um, all good, just missed the first. Wasn't great at the second, or th- no, wasn't great at the third, and then stood in his head at the fifth. Uh, Guest left his off four on the takeoff side, put his near four out through it, did the splits, belly on the floor, and stood up at a standstill. And I think quite rightly, Paul Town and straight away pulled him up. Yeah, it's funny, on the television angle, you couldn't quite see what exactly happened, but it was a case of he, he, he couldn't really keep going. Well, it's do I keep going? Will he be all right? If I stop now, I'm definitely not going to do any more damage, yeah. and hopefully he is all right. But that's a big call, and that's Paul Tanner made the right call. I mean, when you make a mistake like that, you need a miracle to win, and you have to hope the horse is okay. Mm-hmm. And if in doubt, get anyway, out. we we didn't because he, because he pulled up almost immediately. What you didn't really get there was that he'd actually um, stopped to a walk anyway because yeah. of, because of the various things that went wrong in that yeah. in that jump. It was a very heavy landing, yes, which is obviously liable to to produce an injury. And then he's done the splits as well, and I just said belly on the floor. He virtually fell, yeah. Um, and he would have been he'd have been starting again from a standing start, which is never a good thing no, anyway. I know, and people do, and you're running down the hill, and you're thinking, well, I've that much time, maybe I could beat them. But you run down the hill, and he falls at the next. Mm. Yeah, you're you're up to your neck in it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most wanted, and also it doesn't. Most he, wanted. Even though he's got, was he two to nine in the end? Even though he's that short, he's um, he's actually unlikely. Even if he continues and everything is fine yeah. to win the race anyway, yeah. the margins are, are a lot finer than you think at that yeah, level. I would agree. With that in mind, then, and with Gaelic Warrior being a rising force and a potentially returning Endergreen next year, would would El Fabiolo have the scope to step up to something like a Ryanair? Um, his style of running would suggest not. He is quite keen. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens down the line, but yeah. like it's, they just all have to stay in one piece. Yeah, and yeah exactly. There's not you don't you don't move him out of the division because no. of what happens. You, you keep him in there and and you keep your yeah. options open. And I see I see no reason why you shouldn't get another another um, crack at the champion, particularly with nothing else that was in the race this year. But it was a great result for the winner. Yeah, it was and wonderful. It was wonderful to see. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're playing him at the top level yeah. for God knows how long now. Um, always, special TR all over again. Yeah, it? it was. Yeah. But running him at the top level and, you know, Declan Andy is a good owner. Henry's a great record in champion chases and buy a ticket. You can't You're win not a lot. You can't win. It also shows win. that having a heart problem doesn't stop you winning a champion chase. Yeah. Barbara again. Yeah. Barbara again did the same thing. Um, he had, uh, he was, Pulled up with a with a heart issue between his two champion chases and was probably better the second year. Sprinter, Wasn't well, sprinter it? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but we have well, we went through two years of oh, you can't yeah, you can't yeah, do anything yeah. with them because yeah. you have a heart issue. You check them out, you make sure they're healthy, and you push on with them. And that was you know eventually that's what happened with Sprinter Sacker. But it took a wee while for um you know for for that to happen. There was an awful lot of talk about oh, you can't ask him to go too fast. The heart, the heart. Quick word on Edward Stone, which would have uh, impacted your heart. Too soft well, for me, what do you think? Sorry? Ground was too soft for him. Oh, well, see, the, Alan King thinks he wants that ground. So, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think, I think he wants good to soft ground. I think it probably was too soft. Is he a horse Alan King has maybe got wrong a small bit through? Well, he has a little, well, he's, he was, he, I was... <laughs> Not as wrong as William Williams <laughs> as fast as he got. No, 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 no. We'll, um, we'll said, come to that. We'll come to that. Great, great trainer and everything. But yeah, I mean, I said, I said, when we discussed at Cheltenham which just the Ryanair in the first place I said you know the, the problem is that Alan King kind of doesn't want to go for the champion chase because he knows how strong a race it is and he wants to he wants to believe the horse is a two and a half miler and I don't think I think this is not really helpful you can't really commit yourself to your yeah. horse's plan until you until he was beaten at, at Kempton he's then sort of said well I've messed the horse around too much I'm gonna I'm gonna let him enjoy himself at Newbury and he's maybe done too much at Newbury in that you know that's in a prep for Cheltenham, you, you probably want to look after them a little bit, but he almost had to do that to get the horse's confidence back and whether it left a little bit of a mark. We also had this discussion about Alan King saying, well, I've changed, I've changed the training regime for my horses again. I used to ask them to go up three times up the, <laughs> up the hill at the end 
and um, that worked fine. And I've only been, and now I'm only doing two times. Well, I'm guessing they went to two times because the horses weren't seeing their seasons out because they were poss possibly overtrained. Mm -hmm. So he's gone back to that, and maybe Eberson hasn't been at his best. But again, he looked happy through the race for a long way and was just getting tired when he's when he's tipped up. To be honest, you know, he was a percentage call, and the, after he was beaten at Kempton, he was out to 25 for the champion mm -hmm. chase. And for me, well, that was. It's a no-brainer. He's going to go for the championship. So the 25s in a race with not an awful lot of depth was was the each way value. I was already on Captain Guinness pre-Christmas, so I was actually I was hoping both of them would hit the frame. To be honest, and when Elf, I'd be like, "Well, there you go. I should I should get this." I was a wee bit disappointed, but I'd rather I'd rather Captain Guinness um, had won the race. Than I have no problem Guinness. commenting on what races trainers should run horses in. I, I definitely was involved in that even when I was riding but as regards the coaching as they should do mm. twice up to gallop or three times up to gallop I have no opinion of that because <laughs> until you've tried it it's definitely not none of my business a um, couple of other bits on the day uh, Ruby Jasmine DeVoe in the bumper was the horse that got it all done was it kind of a, an emotional enough experience obviously uh, uh, it was kind of poetic in a sense Patrick doing it for his dad and obviously uh Maureen had passed away only a couple of weeks yeah, in advance. Yeah, there was, was a whole of, lot to it, but yeah. it was great thing. Great thing. It was lovely that Patrick rode him. Um, and fair play to him. I probably wouldn't have picked Jasmine DeVoe. I was more with Floro Fazil and one that ran terribly, Argento boy. Cantico was disappointing as well. But uh, Jasmine DeVoe, he was good. Romeo Coolio and Jalan Duderi hmm. were the two talking horses at Gardens and they ran big races. Sounds Victorious, Fishery Lane, the Yellow Clay. I'd say a lot of the right horses came to the fore in the bumper. Yeah. So he just time tells if it was a good race or not. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it always, you, it always you, throws out winners, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, sure. What was it last year's the twenty twenty three edition twenty one ran and they've all won since they, or oh, yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it'll be. Yeah. You would imagine at least the top half will be yeah. uh, somewhat decent next season over hurdles, won't they? Yeah, you'd have thought so. And there were even horses who disappointed there. Um, Cantico, you you mentioned yeah. uh, he ran too bad to be true, and he's he looks the part. Yeah, and he should be all right. I thought the two I took out of the race were uh, the yellow clay and. Um, Hallon Dujeri, mm -hmm. because they were the two who were very handy, who featured in the finishing. Everything else came from off the pace. And a lot of those horses who were handy, who, you know, reasonably well fancied, were very well beaten. The, the Nichols pair set off first and second, and they've ended up finishing something like 12th and 19th or something like that. Whereas um, uh, Hallon Dujeri was always reasonably handy. The, the Yellow Clay is, is, is one that I'd be very keen on um, next season. Again, always, always up in the front rank, kept on well. Uh, for a place and he had a fair old layoff before his previous run I think there's an improvement to come in him and he'll make a jumper certainly Final uh, word on Wednesday no cross country no cross country uh, I walked out in it on was it bad? Two, yeah horrendous I walked out I walked down this part of the track that they were talking about and yeah the ground was moving underneath you and they were saying why don't they run it on Friday and I was thinking well the forecast suggests it yeah. won't be in the dry by Friday the only thing possibly they could have done was if the BHA had the scope is run it on the main track as a chase rather than oh, yeah, as yeah. a cross country yeah. race but they don't have the scope to do that so that's only a suggestion maybe For thinking future, outside yes. the box going forward uh, Niche question ask it anyway I think you, think you had a lot of non-runners that they did that by the way Possibly I don't know you're just looking for yeah. a reason mm, a lot of horses there <coughs> could you, could you, just, whatever. Just give them a chance because it's such a, the cross country the way it's run is it's such a good prep for the Grand National for, for yeah, particularly for Gordon's exactly. that a three mile seven chase on the on the main track actually would not do the same job. But no. it's, it's certainly you don't want to have no some, race, yeah, so you have to have some kind of backup. Thinking or else those that need to go to the first or last race, the long gaps yeah. definitely didn't help. On yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course you can't you can't move races forward, forward because if you've published the race, if you say you know the uh, the Grand Annual is going to be run at uh, uh, four thirty and you run it at four o'clock instead, you know that's. Y yes or no, should the cross-country go back to being a handicap? I don't think it matters that much, but yeah. It's I'd not, make it's it a limited handicap. A limited handicap, okay. but I think compressed. In a, yeah, yeah, anything you want you want to sort of make a handicap, yeah, um, a compressed handicap, maybe not exactly the way they have limited handicaps here, but you'd have bottom weight of, of um, 11 stone and up to up to 12 stone or whatever you want Something to do. Like a, a, a narrow band. It's not a championship race, so you don't have, to, you don't want to, you don't need to have championship weights. Commuter type thing? But one, four, five? No, 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 no. I would more 11, 12 to 10, 12. Okay. Let your top weight be whatever he is. Yeah. But 11, 12 <laughs> to 10, 12. Stone, yeah. yeah, or else you look at it that 
if you've ever won a grade one, you always carry seven pounds. Things like that. Yeah. There are ways of of balancing it. Framing those. Framing those. But it's not. It's not the you know. It's it's not the worst defender at the festival in terms of in terms of field sizes. It's no. just that there are a lot. Of, there are a lot of horses who would call themselves cross country specialists who've got little chance of winning that because they're coming up against top class horses. Yeah. Okay. Onwards we go to Thursday, kicking things off with the Turners, Novices Chase, and. Uh, English horses. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? Uh, Rory, we had two of them here battling it out. They should be decent going forward, shouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, one, two, three for the English. Yes. With, uh, with Jello yeah. in third as well. I, I, I met Dan yeah. Barber a time for him. He said, English racing is back <laughs> on the basis of that result. Uh, yeah. But in fairness, that was um, the best example of a novice chase at the festival. It was competitive on paper. Um, you got a proper race. You know, there were the questions were asked. They got into a bit of a battle from the top of the hill, the top three. Um, and then the, the the big two then really forced slugged it out from the from the second last, and you got a true result in the end. I thought it was a very a, a, a race where you you know if you wanted to advertise the Cheltenham Festival, you'd show that it's a great example of it. And you ended up with proper um, performances that you can say, yeah, these horses are good enough to win Great Ones next season with normal improvement from year to year. Whereas they didn't have that much to to prove. They've run to I mean Gaelic Warriors probably run to the highest level of of the. Um, uh, the novices this season, but he's kind of out outclassed his opposition in the in the Oracle. This was a this was a really uh, good battle where the horses have had to prove they've got the ability to run to a high level, but also they got the, they got the ability to get involved in a um, uh, in a race in a battle where where you know it's not a case of of popping around. A lot of the races were run reasonably slowly, and yeah. the questions weren't really asked of jumping, whereas they were in this race and the front two are very good jumpers. I was a little bit concerned about Greg Dawning early in the season. I thought he was a little bit straight backed in his jumping and I wasn't sure how well that would turn out. Whereas Ginny's Destiny is a very, very sound jumper mm -hmm. and has been uh, from, from day one. Um, but I thought uh, Greg Dawning matched Ginny's Destiny in the jumping this time. It's probably the jump at the last that, that's won him the race in the end. And we know he stays three miles and you know they, they view him very much as a Gold Cup horse and Dan Skelton might have gone for the longer race had the ground been good. Um, so I think, yeah, you'd be positive about it. They're going different directions next season. Ginny's Destiny looks very much a Ryanair horse through and through um, uh, in in the, the mould of, of previous Paul Nichols horses in that race uh, and a real Cheltenham specialist as well. And uh, Grey Dawning was, it will be heading towards the Gold Cup, which obviously will be a tougher path, um, but he's got he's got scope and they've always, they've always talked about him um, in glowing terms, like I don't think he shows anything at home, but they keep saying, "Get him on the track," and he just he just comes alive, and he did it again here. Um, you know the way life occasionally throws you like tricky puzzles to solve. <laughs> so Fasal Vega is one of those, is he? He is. He's just been very disappointing, and he absolutely blew out here, uh, ran poorly, didn't jump well enough, and back to the drawing board. It, his own work is obviously very good, is it? It is, yeah, but that's not much good. No. Well, Didn't see too many horses getting paid out in the gallops. No. <laughs> um, but but, but where, where, do you, where do you go from here? Like, I what do you think do to I turn shall Rainbow? most definitely leave that up to w, WP Mullins. Okay. I'm not getting involved. Okay, sitting on the fence. WP Mullins might be asking somebody else about this one. It's, <laughs> he, he seems to be one of the few horses that he can't quite get his head around either. But. Um, let's move on then. Uh, one of the feature races on day three of the Cheltenham Festival was indeed the Ryanair Chase. And on his day, Ruby, it just seems like Protectorat is quite a good horse. I'd say they nailed it. The right race from yep. Right race, right horse. Um, got a good toe-off stage start. Jumped very well for Harry Skelton. And I think on the ground, just saw it out better than Envoy Allen. Mm. Um, on better ground, not so sure he would have. Mm. thought Envoy Allen arrived at the right time to go at Protectorat. thought it was a good ride from Harry Skelton as well. He waited when he got to Harry Cobden. He didn't commit before he got yeah. to the second last. He waited yeah. for Rachel Blackmore to arrive on his outside and propelled him forward. Uh, good performance from Protectorat though. Two yeah. miles in that trip, two miles and five hurdles. Suited him, suited his jumping, suited the way he travels. Also, yeah, also um, he's been, in most of his races, he's ended up Making the running and having to do his own donkey work being too further. keen. Yeah. And actually, he's, he's really well suited by sitting behind yeah. a strong pace. Yeah. Would you uh, go along with the theory that maybe Dan Skelton has listened to the slagging he's been getting over the last couple of years when he had the kind of he had to scratch the itch and go a bit early and maybe Harry, he's, Harry, or sorry, Harry. Yeah, sorry, well, Dan, Dan did say that in an interview. Yeah. He said he said yes. Harry's found a bit of restraint. Okay, um, yeah. and I thought, well, fair enough. If he's going to mention, it. he didn't he didn't criticize him at all. He said he's got a bit he's he's got a bit of restraint and it, his riding was really good all week. Whereas a couple of years ago yeah but you, you know. have to make mistakes to, yeah. you have to, to make learn, mistakes yeah. to learn yeah. exactly yeah. yeah and so 
you know, you don't you don't kick on down the hill at Cheltenham no. and, and steal Grade One races. You you do in handicaps, um, but you need to you need to make the mistakes to learn, as as Ruby says. And his riding, they have to uh, hurt. <laughs> all all round was excellent. And again, all we talk about Dan Skelton this uh, in the last week is about you know the handicaps. But what did he say? He sent what eleven horses to the festival. And he had four winners and and um, a couple of places in there yeah, as well. Very great. Yeah, really, really good. Um, we're not ruling out Banbridge just got stuck in the mud, possibly. Yeah, surprised he ran, to yeah. be honest. And I was, again, um, the ground was worse this year than last year when he was pulled out because of it. But I guess, I suppose he, he didn't have a run through the winter because of the ground. He had the one run at Kempton. If you don't run at Cheltenham, your season's almost a right off. You might as well take one chance. He's fresh enough now to go to Aintree, and Aintree would suit him. Um, but again, at the same old problem, you know, he needs, he needs the ground to dry out. And we've had such a wet... Uh, winter and early spring that um, it's it's a bit of a question mark so I understand why they ran and to be honest I bailed out of that that position because I was convinced the ground was going to be very soft anyway mm. and reinvested so I wasn't I wasn't quite as mad as I might have been Have you been in that per, uh, position before Ruby where maybe things don't suit but yeah, the, the external pressures are like owner has always like starts run, 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 not, run Not external pressures you're looking at Banbridge so where is he going to run if he doesn't run Last Thursday, his next race is not for four weeks until entry. Yeah, and so here, roll the dice. Yeah, you know, what they the, might handle it. They might go slow. Mm. Some of the others mightn't handle it. I mean, we knew the answers are no one and ever. And of course, they won. They won with the horses didn't want soft ground on the Tuesday. Exactly. So you know, you think. Well, um, and again, I think I think last year, after the result of the of the turn race, they might have been thinking maybe should have run him there, could have won. Um, so I can see why they took the chance this year. But there you go, it didn't work out. He, he didn't have a terribly hard race in the end. Uh, when he was beaten, he was he was given a fairly easy time. Uh, right, oh, the other feature race on day three of the Cheltenham Festival was indeed the Paddy Power Stairs Hurdle, and Tiupu was back like defeat was out of the question, Ruby. Uh, Gordon Elliott probably getting a bit twitchy at that stage. No winner hitting the crossbar plenty, but Tiupu got the job done. Yeah, but that's a hitting the crossbar. His horse were running running really well. They just weren't quite good enough, um, and Tiupu was in, always in a good position. Um, quick and nicely, jump nicely. I probably doubted him. Um, I wasn't convinced about him at the price, but you were only at halfway and you were thinking, God, he's the one you want to be on. Yeah. Uh, they didn't go as hard as I thought they'd go. Uh, Florian Porter went to the front after about five, six furlongs. And again, you know, they didn't follow him and he came back to the field quite easily and he's run a cracking race. He has, Good yeah. call by Gavin yeah. Cromwell as to where to run him. But um, Chupu was the best horse and we looked at him and watched him winning. You're kind of thinking, yeah, he could win a couple of those. He could. I mean, he was, if you want to be critical, he was really well um, served by the run of the race, whereas a few yeah. of the As a horse who's got two and a half mile speed, mm. the fact that um, Florian Porter, I was like watching Florian Porter two years ago under Danny, where he's yeah. managed to, he slowed it down at halfway and got them on a bit of a string in behind. Um, and and Tiapu is the one horse with the with the speed to, to be able to come out of the pack and challenge him. And um, that's that's got the job done. Florian Porter was, again, was, was, um, a nice, a nice little result for me, Anti Post as well. As I said, when he he went fifty to one uh, with Paddy when uh, when Gavin said he would definitely run the National Hunt Chase, and I'm a firm believer that if you keep a horse in two races and you say he's definitely running in one, you're not taking him out, he still might run there. So at fifty to one, um, I had a I had a few bob on, but I also included him. It's you know there were the vibes a few weeks before Cheltenham were sounding like he was there was a fair chance of him running on the stairs, and he was still a good price, and I, I threw him in the old. The old multiple to get a couple of bombs. So I was pleased with that. Mayor's novice Rory, uh, brighter days ahead. Uh, a big, uh, you're That's, a big fan. Uh, I, I had to get the positives in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, before the negatives came. Uh, bad following, good here. Things didn't really go to plan. Just keen and free. Well, I think I think this is a little bit of jockey error. No, I don't want to knock the the, the winner. The winner has, has done it nicely. She's she's been very impressive mm. in in uh, lesser company this season. She had a lot, showed a lot of promise in bumpers last year. She's won uh, turning handsprings at Taunton in a couple of ordinary races, and she looks a decent mare. Uh, so I don't want to knock um, uh, Golden Goldness Ace. at all. But um, Jack has ridden the race as if he's got one horse to beat, and he's basically riding to get that horse beat rather than just looking to win the race himself. Brighter Days Ahead stays well. She's won over two mile five, two, two mile five and a half last time out. We know that, you know, in a strongly run race, she's the likeliest winner, but it ends up being not a strongly run race. It wasn't a typical Jiggenstein ride either. He wasn't he wasn't wide in the track and, yeah, and you know handy. Uh, handy. He was he was handy enough, but he was always always looking to his inside to um uh to Willie's mare. And I think 
I'm not sure that he was he would he necessarily have won the race anyway. As I said, I don't want to I don't want to knock the the winner, but I think he concentrated too much on one horse and didn't ride his mare to the best of her ability. He rode her as if she was in a match race, and that hasn't worked out in the end. Would you look at changing the penalty structure here just to make no. it a little bit like less like mares dodging each other, particularly in the UK through the season because no, they're avoiding th- each other in listed company. They and- are, they are a little bit, yeah. And both Dice Arenos didn't run in the end. She was, she was lame in the morning, and she, she's, she's deliberately running in uncompetitive races to get in there. But the problem is, if you change the penalty, you're, you're trying to turn it into Grade One. It's either a Grade One or it's not a Grade One. If yeah. it's a Grade Two, then you have. <laughs> Then you have but that the, was the, the uncertainty structure. of it too. So you're saying you, that's the problem. So you're changing the penalty structure to get them to clash earlier in the year. But if they crash twice earlier yeah, in the rumors. year, you already know you don't already know the result, but you're less likely to try and take someone on that's already beaten you twice. So the more you can keep them apart, the more clashes you have come, gentlemen. Yeah. That's a lot of the, lot of the problem. So yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a massive problem with the penalty structure. And of course you can you can you basically make a choice. You either you run your horse in races that it's going to win easily against inferior opposition, and you run the risk that they're not tough enough when they come to the big day, or you run them in graded company and you know how good they are and you know they're tough enough to win, but you're giving weight away and that's an uncertainty as well. So you just you you take your choice. What's the debrief on Jade DeGruji? Again, slowly run race, looked like she wanted a bit further. Um and I'd say, yeah, I agree with Rory. I'd say Jack would probably like another go. Paul said to me he'd like another go as well. But look, you, you play your cards the way you play them. And yeah, and she's got stuck on the far side yeah, because of what's happened always, as you well. You don't want to always so. maximise what ja- the hand you have, but that's tactics. Yeah. Uh, elsewhere Thursday, Mon Morale, Shake Him Up Parry. I know the way you're thinking, big punt. Any of you want a word on any Shake of those? Shake Him Up Parry was good to watch. Uh, I know the way you're thinking. Got a fantastic ride, but God knows what he had in hand. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mon Morale got a fabulous ride too from mm. the back, Harry yeah. Cobden. Um, I thought that was a really well-timed ride. Yes, and he's he's not been the easiest horse no. to, to catch right. He had a big reputation. He bolted up at the entry as a juvenile and they were talking about champion hurdles with him and he's been hard to get a handle on since then. But I, I, I must say, I did not have him down as a uh, as a horse for that trip, but he showed that he... Uh, he showed that he got it um, on the day. Um, the fact that he had the tactical speed there was probably important. And I just had a really good ride. Uh, I know the way you're thinking did plenty wrong in the very early stage. Yeah. He ballooned the first two fences. Um, he's actually set off, as they've left the tape, he's probably first yeah. on the inside as they go to the first fence. And he's uh, disputing last after two fences. Um, we've seen that before in the race um, a, a few years ago with uh, Mount Ida. Yes. who would, was a million after jumping three fences and came through to win. And that's the thing about the Kim Muir, because of the quality of the race, if you've got a horse who's got a load of talent and you've got a top-class jockey, you can make your ground mid-race past, past moderate, moderate enough horses. And he's looked a very impressive winner in the end. But again, he's, a, he's better than a 145 horses. Pre, you know, yeah. he, I was surprised he, he got into the race. Mm. I, I thought the handicap was, was uh, lenient on him. And of course, his form in grade one chase, uh, novice chases, looked an awful lot better before he lined up anyway but for a horse to go off at 13 to 8 in a race like the Kim Muir something slightly wrong there you shouldn't be you, sh- you know again that should be a really open race for openly com- um, campaigned horses and that I didn't think it, it didn't spoil the race it still made it interesting but you know the fact that you have one horse who's absolutely cornering the market and dominating the betting and the race itself is is not great for everybody else who's involved Wednesday and Thursday done and dusted Friday coming at you after this short break great result Thanks, Peter. Coming up, we have League Action live on Friday night, followed by three more games live on Saturday, then two more massive games live on Sunday. And don't forget, League Action live on Monday night. Then it's over to Europe for the big one, live on Tuesday. Then the even bigger one, live on Wednesday. Then it's the other Europe. Sometimes a break isn't a bad idea. So, if ever you want to take time out from betting, use Paddy Power's Take a Break tool to pause your account. Paddy Power. Welcome back. Uh, the fourth and final day of the Cheltenham Festival 2024 to review in the company of Roy Delargan and Ruby Walsh. We're kicking things off with the Triumph Hurdle. And in fairness to you, Ruby, you've been singing and dancing about Madgeborough all year. A fine type of horse, not your typical uh, Triumph Hurdle little run to be oak. Yeah, look, that's what he was. Um, I doubt I tipped him. I most definitely didn't have anything on him, but he was the horse looking at them all that you would think, wow. He'd be a lovely chase, or he could be a grand horse in time. And um, he grounded out to be Gar- Cargis. Salver was a good third. I uh, thought a couple of Willies were disappointing myself. Um, Stormheart ran below, Bunting ran below. Um, but look, Majbra, yeah, he's a fine big specimen and he's going to be a, a lovely chase. So whether that's next season or the season after, it remains to be seen. 
Okay, so one or two out the back, maybe keep an eye out for them for the big four year old handicap in the stall, maybe. I wouldn't have thought so. I just thought even by now they'd be too high for that, but I just thought a couple of them didn't run up to what they could. No. Okay. Uh let's move on, Rory. Talk about the, the county hurdle absurd. Uh, uh another Paul Town and Masterclass. Yeah, funny old race the county, and it's not it's not a race that, that um that needs a lot of analysis because it got very messy, but it suited Absurd. But he still needed to have balls of steel to ride him the way that Paul did, um, which which suits. So you know, he, he didn't want to be among horses because his jumping is is very novice. He's still very lightly raced um, as a hurdler, not not too lightly raced to get into the race, um, but clearly very very classy. Um, winning the Ebor last year, so doing a, a sea pigeon. On that front, although Sea Pigeon, I think, was already proven champion hurdle class before he won his Ebor. Um, and yeah, his jumping wasn't wasn't brilliant, but again, the way you had to ride him, you either had to go out in the front to let him see his hurdles on his own, or ride him out the back so he could see the hurdles. Um, and then you've got to have an awful lot of confidence that you can ride him like that and then come through late in the mm -hmm. day. The way the race panned out was ideal. The way the race cut up also was ideal. I think what, 17 runners in the end? Yeah, there was seven non-runners, I think, yeah. there thereabouts, no gallop. Then everyone gets racing away from the second last and it mm. kind of splits, splits into around. a narrow head formation yeah. um, and Paul's able to pick his lines. It was great to watch, but he was riding the fastest horse and it was an absolute dash, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. so absolutely them ideally. And of course, you know, there'd be plenty of hard luck stories in a race like this with, with a full field, but the fact that you had the non-runners meant the spaces, the gaps were there for him and he's taken them. And it's, it'll be interesting to see where he, what, you know, what he does in the next year because obviously you got, you know, he, he ran very well in the Melbourne Cup. Don't think he quite stayed too much. I mean, it's a. I think he. I think he could win a Melbourne Cup. But I think that there's a, a notion um, that if you're ridden very, pro if you're a horse that you think is going to stay and you're ridden very prominently, there should get an advantage. But the way races are run um, in Australia means it, it it does suit the horses who can show a turn of foot even at two miles from off the pace. So I think although he looked like he didn't get home, if he was ridden more. Um, uh, more circumspectly on that and asked to come from from behind again he actually could maybe win a melbourne cup so they might want to go and do that again um yeah i mean he could turn into champion hurdle horse if he learns to if he learns to jump but i think that's i don't think he's you're either a brilliant jumper of a hurdle if you're going to be a champion hurdle horse or you're or you're not and i think he probably doesn't bridge that gap even though he's got the class to do it um but there's lots of stuff to do with him on the flat. He's, you know, he's not had that much racing since he's joined Willie uh, from France. So, um, you know, second of a tour at Royal Ascot. I can see him go back to Royal Ascot again. You know, a lot of money available there, and um, he's a horse that uh, you'd love to have an interest in. Yeah, loads of options, Ruby. Um, obviously, a very talented horse. Um, what do you think the future holds for him? I'd imagine he'll go back to Australia. Okay. Uh, now he only qualified for the Melbourne Cup. Do you get last to go year. on that junket now? Do you just go no. down and no? You will uh, be there, though. I'd say you'll try your best. I'll try my best, anyway. Are you he, an idea to producer Mark? I have, but sure, I might be talking to the wall. <laughs> um, he qualified through winning the Ebor. Yeah. So he would have to get black type form on the flat this summer yeah. to get himself in. Vintage crop sticks. Vintage crop sticks. Like yeah, yeah. yeah Some, maybe some three, yeah, three know, runners in the vintage crop. Yeah, I know, but it is there. That and is, it is. You know, you've got to win a listed race or be placed in yeah, group three. Group so, three, yeah. so it is there. He would have to, he, yeah. that's how he ended up there last year because of winning the Melbourne Cup. Or yeah, the Ebor. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, quick word on Paul Townend who had the week of his life. Super week. Uh, Cut him, he bleeds confidence. He's just like, doesn't, <laughs> yeah. no panic That's whatsoever. Uh, yeah, but like, it, and a lot of big decisions are not just big decisions, but tough decisions. Like, he didn't leave one behind either. No. He didn't come out there thinking I rode the wrong one there. Um, it's just a great week for him, but he's a brilliant rider and it does, doesn't affect him. How would you describe him as as a jockey? Is he a, a stylish kind of? He is that cool came, from, came from the flat. Very stylish, great seat, good hands. Um, he's confident, a good fella. But he's a good person. Yeah. He's the same. Like he started in Winnie's and he was fifteen, and all right, he's grown from a boy into a man. But he hasn't changed very much. Manners or mannerisms or no ego, no no side to him. Good um, fella. Good fella. And the the cherry on top for Paul Townend came in the feature race at day four of the Cheltenham Festival with Gallop and Deschamps yeah. in the second Gold Cup. And a much different race to the race last year. Much different ride. Um, but ultimately the same result. And 
yeah, I, it was a good ride. Like my heart was in my mouth now watching fast or slow from the fourth mm. last all the way down to the home turn thinking, where are you going to go? How does Paul get by you, go to you? Um, I could see Jerry Colomb coming, you're looking at, um, it was Long Presley in front on the inside, you're thinking, Jesus, where do you go now? But look, it, it just worked out and good jump at the second last, brilliant jump at the last, got himself to the line. Uh, a very good horse. Not as flashy maybe as last year's performance. No. A no. bit more workman like, but I'd say with the ground and the season he's had, it was good to see him winning. In a situation like that with a loose horse, is there anything you as a jockey can do? Obviously, you can't ride the loose horse, but can you get up and kind of intimidate them I, away from you? Or I, I you suppose you, you, going at it sounds like the wrong thing to say, but like when they jumped the third last, it looked like fast or slow was going to drift wide. Yeah. So Paul switched in, but almost then straight away, fast or slow went back to long press. So Paul had come to the other side. You just don't want to get into a race with that horse where that horse decides, I'm going to keep beating you and takes you off. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So you, you kind of have to wait till the loose horse decides what he's going to do. And you're second guessing. Mm. Uh, Rory, Paul Townend, uh, equaling the record number of Gold Cups for a rider now, with backing his fourth with Gallop and Deschamps. Uh, wh a quick word on, on horse and jockey. Yeah, it was, as Ruby said, it wasn't as flashy a win as last year, but he put up the, pla the flashy performance at Christmas. Yeah. Um, his win um, in the Savills Chase was exceptional. Uh, where he beat the Gold Cup second by a lot further it was twenty two lengths or so on the day. So you know he basically he's put on one of the one of those stellar performances to show exactly how good he was. And then you know in the Gold Cup was a case of getting the job done. Uh, it was a great race to watch. It, it almost always is. Um, there was yeah, it, it kept you on the edge of your seat really, didn't it? Um, I enjoyed. I well, I I needed Corak Rambler to hit the frame <laughs> for for Cheltenham to be a success for me at that stage. Um, so I was delighted with that, and that worked out. From, from from that point of view, that worked out perfectly. The script you knew he was going to sit at the back and just pass horses as they were beaten. And there was a case of could he find more from the last? And he actually, the old head came up in the air halfway up the running, and uh, he finished a bit tired. But that was that was nice to see, and I'd say it sets him up nicely for the national. But obviously, you don't have an easy race in the Gold Cup, and plenty of horses have have looked to to give themselves a big chance in the national, um, only to to run flat. So that we'll see what he does. But yeah, Gallop and has done it really well. Paul's ridden brilliantly all week. I thought this is, I don't want to knock Jack Kennedy again, but if you compare the riding of the two of them all week, Jack just didn't quite have the, have the confidence. He was going for gaps that weren't always there. And, he, you know, those split second decisions always went to, uh, Paul's way because he was just full of confidence because he's been, he's been, you know, riding winners uh, regularly all season. And, and Jack's been a, a little bit stop start in the last couple of years, obviously, for, for, for reasons that we're aware of. But he's a very, very classy rider. And his, you know, next year maybe. He'll be coming in full of confidence, and you'll get a raft of winners for Gordon. Whereas with a lot of, you know, seconds and thirds, that you know, with a little bit of better luck, things might have gone differently. But when you're riding with that confidence, those split second decisions tend to go your way. And when you're riding, you're lacking the confidence, then it tends to be the other side of the coin. But um, yeah, great to see, um, great to see that all uh, um, all week from Paul. Um, and you can't beat a back-to-back -back Gold Cup winner. We we waited, seemed to wait. A generation for one, and now they're coming along every like uh, every bustles, few yeah. years. Yeah, all coming together. Um, very good. Uh, yes, a very imp impressive performance from Gallop and Deschamps, and uh, our Cheltenham fan zone in the Camden last Friday. The crowd there really enjoyed it. I think we're going to show you a clip of that now. Jumping the last and going on to win a second Gold Cup. Very good. Uh, the crowd enjoyed that very much. Uh, Ruby, qu a quick word on a few of the others. Jerry Lam ran a blinder, um, and Car Rambler, as Rory mentioned, uh, stayed on quite well. Uh, would you see that as a good prep? Oh, for the I national? would, yeah. I felt uh, sorry for Jay just Levin and Martin Brazil. I mean, yes. fast or slow, didn't do a whole pile wrong, but just one of those things your body, get your body position forward on landing from a jump. As you would be, but the horse nods and you're left sitting in midair yeah. and off you come easier than you'd like. So felt sorry for them and Sean Mulrain. It can happen anywhere any day, any day, but it's a dose when it happens in a big race like that. So I did feel sorry for them. But yeah, I thought the ones 
they were the most likely ones. I thought Gallopin, Faster Slow, Corey Cranber and Jerry Callum, they were the four to me and the three of them were. Yeah, and Lund Lund Presley's run really well. I I don't think he quite stays three and a quarter miles. Probably didn't. But he's run an absolutely brilliant race until the last fence and then just get tired from there. Fair. Um, The Albert Bartlett, as it often does, uh, threw up a funny result. Stellar story won the Albert Bartlett Ruby. Uh, Reading Tommy wrong well back didn't really fire. Uh, How was he after? Blew out, ran absolutely stink. Uh, Dancing City was the best at Willie's finish in third. But Reading Tommy wrong was well beaten at the top of the hill. Uh, High class hero didn't run much better. He was a bit keen. Uh, But Stellar story, great winner for... um, Sam Ewing yep. um, felt because I, I felt sorry but the jukebox man did everything right yeah. uh, for nabbed. for Keelan Woods and just got nabbed uh, he got tight to the last letter story pinged it yep. and was a whisker from nodding over the height he got behind yeah, yeah. Um, but a good performance from him and I thought Dancing City ran the best of willies but yeah it, it, it keeps throwing it up doesn't it shock winners yep. uh, the race that's for hunter chasers, not the fox hunters. Uh, <laughs> Rory was won by a CNA nominee who was put up by Frank Hickey, entry post, uh, interestingly. And uh, it's another good result in terms of the Corinthian spirit of the indeed, race. Indeed, indeed. Um, all the uh, all the hunter chaser experts seem to seem to be keen on the CNA nominee. Uh, in the last week before the race, the uh, the two that I follow on Twitter both put it up independently at sixteens. Um, and yeah, he's a he's a horse who'd um, who'd been very impressive early in the season at, at Weatherby. Um, but it's, it was kind of not the easiest to get a handle in his form until fairly recently. But he's a nice, he's a nice type, good old fashioned hunter chaser, uh, running in the same colours as last option. Who Fiona Needham um, rode. rode to win the race, and when she did, she was wearing um, the silk. The, I think the silks were about sixty years old. They weren't silks. They were. It was a proper old fashioned pullover, um, Bull, darned, at the, darned at the elbows yeah, and have been yeah. on the go for ages. So it's nice to see the. Um, they had a new set of colours um, for for this one, but yeah, he looks a he looks a, a, a horse to follow in the, in that sphere for uh, for a couple of years. He's a he's a good sort. Uh, Ruby, the Mrs. Paddy Perrin mares chase all change at the top of the market overnight and in the morning. Dino Blue and Limerick all Lace. change with the ground, wasn't it? Yeah, and they uh, rode into Limerick Lace, who had the stamina uh, placed in the tritone, wasn't yeah, she? She was. Um, wasn't she? They rode into the the stamina laden mare over the classy one and. I must say, going to the last, I didn't know which way it was going to go. I thought Dinah Blue was coming to mm. pick off Limerick Lace, but Limerick Lace possibly outstayed her. Yeah. And uh, it was a great week for Limerick Lace's dam. She had two runners. Yeah, two runners, two winners. I know yeah. the way you're thinking, so yeah. great week for her. Yeah, if you could find a mirror like her, you'd be laughing. I, and must, I must say, I was a little bit negative about her going in because she'd, when she was third in the Troy Town, she looked... Um, <coughs> swished her tail. She looked like, like the winner. Yeah. She swished her tail. And she swished, swished her tail last year in the Webster Cup, but she looked like winning. And I thought, I'm not sure I'd really want her up the hill, but she got herself in front yeah. in the first place. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd rather she was in front jumping the last and trying to come from behind. Yeah. Okay. But she's she's done it nicely in the end. And of course, my my auntie post tip was the, uh, the stable mate who was a non-runner in the morning. Right. So, so. there you go. Yeah, good things happen to good people. Um, <laughs> final race of the festival, uh, Martin Pipe, uh, br- better days ahead, uh, giving Gordon Elliott a third winner and a good ride from young master Danny Gilligan. Uh, anything else in behind, catching your eye, Rory? Um, Gordon's uh, um, other horse, uh, What's Up Darling, is that it? Yeah. yeah. I thought that ran, I mean, I liked that in the race. I thought it ran really well. Of course, on its, on its previous start, I was trying to give a stone away to... Um, Lantry Lady in the Red Mills trial at Gore, and I think that's a, I think um, that's one to keep an eye on next season. We'll we'll um, we'll jump the fence certainly, and of course, the Martin Pipe. The, the good thing with this race is the type of horse that run in it. Um, they tend to be a rich source of winners over fences the following season as well. Okay, uh, Ruby, anything you'd like to say just to get off your chest, or do you want to wish anyone a happy birthday or? Anything like that? No. <laughs> Whose birthday is it? I don't know. You just like uh, this is your. I feel like I'm under pressure. You, you know, <laughs> forget someone's birthday. Is this the hardest <laughs> question about? No, you do just anything you'd like to say about the 2024 yeah. Cheltenham Festival or 19th of March. It's nobody's birthday. <laughs> it's like it's not you. a trick question. It's, it's just like you'd like to say. You. Are you forgetting something? <laughs> you know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Did I have a script? Uh, no, no, no. Well, you have a running order, but you obviously didn't read it. Anyway, yeah. uh, Mar- <laughs> Mark will give out to you after this. Anyway, uh, Rory, anything? else uh, any in any of the other races any eye catchers that we get didn't get a chance to mention no I've mentioned the one I mean I think you can go through some of those races again and um, you, you'll find more eye catchers but there were a lot of races where uh, in in 20 runner races you'd have found a lot more hard luck stories there weren't many hard luck stories no. in a lot of races this season so I thought it was a lot easier to unpick um, than some years and and um, maybe less 
maybe less eye-catching ones as a result, but a few of those races, you know, the likes of the I Martin Pipe, the likes of the Champion Bumper, yeah. they're the ones worth rewinding and looking for promise in behind. I'd say just, I think the soft ground definitely played to a lot of the results being the way they should be, being really, no, nothing just screamed, I was unlucky. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, the good people at Paddy Power, I believe, do indeed have anti post betting on uh, the majority of the grade ones uh, at the 2025 Cheltenham Festival. So, in the spirit of the game, uh, I'll ask you for two horses each. Uh, to put two horses, oh, yeah, two put, now. To put oh. in a long range, uh, lucky, 15 lucky 15. Lucky 15 for, for, oh, for, for the Cheltenham Festival grade ones, obviously. Uh, and uh, you can put in a oh, short a, ad break here. It's the Constitution Hill. Slade Steel. For the? Arkle. Okay. Oh, I'd say Turners. Oh, oh Jesus. That's the problem you have with that. We're in the one lucky 15 here, so uh, if you want to put him in the Turners, put him in the Turners. Uh, well, uh, well, yeah, and then you have one non-runner. One. Um, I'll, I'll throw an outsider in who I, I put up uh, this season, but he ended up missing most of the campaign. Adex des Oboe for next year's champion chase. Champion chase, Alex Now Oboe. with Nicky Henderson, um, he, he moves to oh, Moore. Moore. Oh, yeah. He yeah, was third yeah. in the Tingle Creek and he moved from Garnie Moore to Nicky Henderson afterwards, but picked up an injury and was um, scratched for the remainder of the season okay, in December. So, so Slade Steel in the Arkell or Turners? You can't have both. Oh, I think Turners. 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 Haddock des Oboe in the Greenwater Champion Chase. Two more. Uh, Mer- Jade de Grugy in the Mayor's Hurdle. Jade de Grugy, Mayor's Hurdle, okay, right. Yeah, that's a fair one. Uh, brighter Days Ahead in the Mayor's Chase. Brighter oh, Days yeah. Ahead in the Mayor's Chase. There you go, very good. They're happy now. That's creative though. thinking. That was very good. I enjoyed that. You worked it out together. Excellent. Right, oh, thank you very much for your company. My thanks to Rory Delargy and Ruby Walsh. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show and indeed the whole Cheltenham Countdown series. Make sure you're subscribed to the Paddy Power Racing YouTube channel to pick up on all the racing content coming up uh, to, uh, your way in the run-up to Aintree and onwards through Pontchartown and into the flat season. Uh, and uh, m- make sure if you're having a bet any week, uh, make sure to always do so responsibly. Ruby and Rory are back on their weekly slot on the From the Horse's Mouth podcast, giving you all the winners on ITV Racing. And on that podcast feed, you'll also have Fridays with Fran, giving you a few winners and what remains of Dundalk before the lights are switched off and the turf gets underway in earnest. I've been Tom Nugent. This has been the Cheltenham Festival 2024 review. Good luck. <laughs>